We previously discussed how a relation is some type of a relationship between two quantities, like an x and a y value. One of the ways we can represent a relation is by using an equation. I can choose whatever value I want for x, I can substitute it into whatever my equation happens to be, and that will give me a y value. I can choose a different value for x, I can substitute it into whatever that equation happens to be, and I can get a y value. In that sense, a function is the same as a relation. I can choose any value for x, I can substitute it into whatever that function happens to be, and I can get a y value. So a function is a relation, but there's one key difference. Let's start with the relation. This represents some type of an equation that I have. I'm going to put some x values into that equation and I'm going to get a y value. So let's start with, let's say x happens to be 25. I put it into my equation and I get a y value of five. Let's pick x is 16. I put it into my equation and y comes out to be four. Let's say x is 36. I put it into my equation and y comes out to be six. Can you guess what my equation or what my relation is? Now let's say x happens to be 16 again. This time I put it in there, same relation, same equation, and y comes out to be negative four. You may have guessed what the relation was. I started off with y squared equals x, and then because we usually begin with y equals, in order to get rid of that squared, I square rooted both sides to isolate my variable y. And when I did that, remember we end up with a positive and a negative value for x. So if I happen to put in x is 16, the square root of 16 will give me four, but the square root of 16, we also have a secondary root that is negative four. So for the same x value, I have two different y values. And that's okay if it's a relation. That will not, however, make it a function. If I have a function, if I put in one x value, I can only get one unique y value. These are two different y values. That makes it a relation, but it is not a function. You're going to think of some packing boxes that you can stack. In the smallest box, you're going to pack all of your functions in there, and then you're going to put that box inside of the relations box. Here is my box of functions. Every function that exists is packed inside of this box. I'm going to take this box with all of my functions in it and I'm going to put it inside of a bigger box of relations. So all functions are relations, but not every relation is a function. I can still have some relations in here that are relations, there's a connection between x and y, but they are not a function because there is not one unique y value for each x value. Here are our boxes. So every function does have some relationship between x and y. Those values are connected, making it a relation. Not every relation is a function because in order to be a function, there is exactly one y value for a given x value. So for every domain, there is a unique value for the range. That means one y only for that particular value of x. If we know on a graph that there can only be one y value for each x value, that means we want to take a look at the x-axis and we're going to say for every value along this x-axis, our graph can only be hitting one y value at a certain point. So the easiest way to test for this is what we call the vertical line test, where we take a vertical line that runs up and down and we run it across the graph. So I'm going to grab my vertical line here. And let's just take this and we're gonna go across. And we're looking for how many points is that graph touching my vertical line? So one, 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 one. This is good. So my first graph here on the left is an example of a function because all the way along there for every value of X, I only have one Y value. And the reason they show a pencil is because a pencil is something you almost always have on hand in math. So just run your pencil along the graph and you're looking for how many times does that graph touch the pencil 
pencil at any given point. Now, when I take my vertical line and run across the second graph, you can see right there we have a problem. We're touching two points on the graph, two, 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 and it doesn't matter how many times we hit two points. As soon as we have two points, we failed the test. So in this second example, right here and right here on that vertical line, Let's say x happens to be, I don't know, negative 5, whatever x is, y is a positive value and y is a negative value. I cannot have two y values for one value of x. So the second graph is not a function, it did not pass the test. We have some examples of relations represented in three different ways. We have table of values, we have graphs, and we have ordered pairs. We're going to pick out which of them are functions and which are not functions. And I'm going to start with my graph because I can quickly run the vertical line test and see. So I'm going to take my vertical line, I'm going to go over to my first graph, and as my vertical line is going across, I'm checking how many points does that gra uh, graph touch the line. And at each point, it's only one, so that is a function. If I take the vertical line over to my next graph, this point of x is okay, and now we have a problem. Do you see right there? As soon as we have two different y values for one x value, it's no longer going to be a function. So we know that this particular graph here is going to be good, and this graph over here is not going to be a function. Now keeping that same principle in mind, knowing we can only have one y value for each x value, this particular table of values, x is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So that means along my x-axis, you could even draw a sketch if you wanted to, x is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Because my x values are all different, it doesn't matter what y is. For each different value of x, I'm going to have a different y value because none of my x's happen to be the same. And you could even sketch that out and see. Here I have a problem on this table of values because I have x is 2 in both of these cases. One time when x is 2, y is 5. One time when x is 2, y is 7. I cannot have two different y values for the same x value. So that is not going to be a function. Okay, I drew these out for you just so you could see. So here when x is 2, we're not going to pass the vertical line test. I have two different values for y. Whereas here, x is 1, y is 3, x is 2, y is 3, that's okay. I've got a horizontal line, which is good, but I don't have that vertical line that's going to indicate it is not a function. All right, so the last two are ordered pairs, and again, look at the x first. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4. So when I go to graph those, 1, 2, 3, 4, it doesn't matter what y is. Each x value is different, so I'm good. This is going to be a function, uh, this set of ordered pairs here. On the second one, x is 1 and x is 1. x is, well, the whole way across x is 1. But here, y is 1 when x is 1, y is 2 when x is 1. I can't have two different values for the same x value. So that second set of ordered pairs, this is not going to be a function. This here is function notation. You're going to see it all the time as you move through higher level mathematics. It is not f times x. It's not like algebra. It's a way that we read a function. So we say f of x or we say f at x. This is how it comes up most frequently. f obviously stands for function, but you're going to see it a variety of ways. So you might sometimes see g of x. You might see f of a. You might see, if we're comparing distance and time, we'll say what is the distance at a certain time. So there's different variables we can put in there, but that indicates that we have a function. y equals 2x plus 8 is a relation. It's a degree one equation, degree one relation. So when I go to graph it, it's going to make that straight diagonal line. And that line is going to pass the vertical line test, which means this is also a function. So to write it in function notation, I'm replacing that y with my f of x, and I'm keeping this part the same. So this is the function notation that represents this relation. We can also use this to substitute in various values for x to generate a y-coordinate. So for example, I'm going to take the same relation, same function, and we're going to say if this is my general function, let's figure out what the specific y-value is when x happens to be 4. So I'm going to substitute this 4 into the place of x here, and we're going to write this out. So we're going to have 2 
times 4 plus 8. We know 2 times 4 is 8, and we know 8 plus 8 is 16. So this tells us when we go to graph it, when x is 4, y is 16. That produces a coordinate point. So we say f of 4, or when f is at 4, y is 16. Because remember, f of x is basically equal to y, which means that is an ordered pair that we can then plot on our graph. All right, let's try a few of these. So I have a different function. I know it's going to be linear because, again, this is degree 1. I want to figure out in the first order what is the value of y when x is 0. So we're going to substitute this in. We're going to say 2 when x is 0, what is the value of y? 2 times 0 is 0. 0 plus 3 is 3. So that produces an ordered pair. For this particular relation, when x is 0, I know y is going to be 3. And we don't need to write that out every time. That just tells us what we're doing. Now, the second one, f is going to be negative 4. So again, we substitute that in. We say 2 times negative 4 plus 3. We know 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 3 is negative 5. There's another ordered pair we could then graph. When x is negative 4, y is negative 5. We can also substitute variables in here. So m is going in the place of x, so I'm going to have 2 times m plus 3. And now if I go to simplify this, these are not like terms, so I can't combine them. So that is my final answer. It's just going to be 2m plus 3. And then in the final question, now they want us to determine x, and they're telling us that f of x is 11. Now remember, f of x is kind of the same as y, so we're saying that value is 11. So I'm going to go up here to my original function, and I'm going to substitute 11 in for the place of f of x. So when we do this, we're going to say 11 now is equal to that 2x plus 3, and now we have a linear equation we're going to solve for x first thing we're going to do is remove any piece we're adding or subtracting. So we know 11 minus 3 gives us 8 is equal to 2x. 3 minus 3 is 0. And we're going to divide out that leading coefficient. 2 divided by 2 will leave us with the 1x. And 8 divided by 2 is 4. So in this particular example, when x is 4, that y is going to be 11. We have another function here. It is not a linear function because it's going to be degree 2. It actually makes it a quadratic function, but it still is a function. It will pass that vertical line test. You're going to go through and do these four examples. I want you to pause the video and see if you can figure out what is the value of y when f is at 3, and then carry on from there, and then come back and see how you did. Okay, the one thing you have to watch with this one is the brackets. If f if x happens to be positive 3, a positive value in here squared will give us 9 minus 4 is 5. But if we have a negative value, remember these brackets are crucial because we're squaring the sign as well as the base of that power. A negative squared becomes positive. So we have 25 minus 4 gives us 21. And again, x is this entire piece. So we're squaring the 2 as well as the variable a, leaving us with 4a squared minus 4. No like terms, so we are simplified there. Now, if f of x is 32, we're going to put 32 in for f of x, and we're going to solve this. Remember, we're going to first remove any piece we're adding or subtracting. We're going to add 4 to bring the constant to 0, and then we're going to do the same thing on the other side, always to keep it in balance. I'm going to square root to get rid of that squared, and I'm going to do the same thing to my other side to keep it in balance. And now, remember when we square root this, because we have a variable here, we are going to have a positive and a negative value, a principal root and a secondary root. So if x is, we can go back up here, if x is positive 6 squared is 36 minus 4 gives us that 32 value, but because that goes into brackets, negative 6 squared is also 36 minus 4 gives us that 32 value as well. And to conclude, let's throw some AP examples in here for fun. So we have another function. This is, again, a quadratic function because it is degree 2. It's not going to be linear, but it is a function. I'm going to begin by substituting negative 2 in the place of x. So you have to watch the brackets. Negative 2 squared is positive 4 times 3 is 12. Negative 5 times negative 2 is positive 10 and plus 2 on the end. 12 plus 10 is 22 plus 2 is 24. So keep in mind you're going to put that value for x in brackets and then I want you to go through and try it and see what you can do when you simplify it. I might leave myself enough room, so I moved the third one over to the side there. 
Remember, you have to FOIL this out. We're squaring a binomial. So I squared the first term, doubled the product, squared the last term. And then we're also distributing this negative 5 in to get rid of those brackets. We're going to then distribute that 3 into the trinomial to get rid of those brackets. Combine your like terms, and we will end up with 3a squared plus a. Because over with my constant terms, 3 plus 2 is 5, minus 5 gives me 0. And then when we put a square root in, we know when we square a square root, that cancels out the square root. So we end up with 3 times 3 is 9. We have negative 5 times the square root of 3, which we can't simplify that. There is no perfect square in there. And then we have a plus 2, which combines with that 9. So we have 7 minus 5 times the square root of 3.